occupying more than one fourth of the state of Michigan, but home to only 3% of its population. The Upper Peninsula is a vast and peaceful landscape of waters and wilderness. However, it was what laid beneath the scenery that would attract thousands of 19th century settlers to this region, copper. In this episode, I will learn what happened to this once robust mining industry and explore the beauty that still remains above its scarred surface. I also meet with an old friend to learn a few of the region's historic recipes and join him for my favorite kind of party ever, for a taste of history from Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Tranquility, beautiful scenery, authenticity, and of course, history. There isn't much that this unique place in the Midwest United States doesn't have. Stretching north into the center of Lake Superior, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, or the UP as the locals call it, was once the bustling center of the mining world during the late 1800s copper boom. As you pass through these quiet towns, the remnants of these former mining complexes and the fortune that they created are still on full display. Located at the northernmost tip of the peninsula is the picturesque town of Copper Harbor. My longtime friend, Chef Dan Harry, runs a German-style restaurant here. Dan and I have worked all over the world together, so I'm really looking forward to finally seeing his roots and the recipes he's developed over the years. Walter, is that you? Hey, 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 what are you doing? Yeah, well, you're catching me in a bad moment. I can catch no fish here. No fish? So good to see you. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and the Harbor House Restaurant. So glad to have you here. Well, you've been sending me pictures for years, so I finally got here. What a fantastic scenery around here. Beautiful, huh? Lake Superior, largest freshwater lake in the, oh, in the world, gosh. doctor. But you know what? I'm not a good fisherman, obviously, as you can tell. You don't have no bait. This way, what well, it is. <laughs> I, I can show you a much easier place to get fish than out here, okay? So let me show you, okay? I can't wait for that. <laughs> Lake Superior is bountiful. It's got lake trout, salmon, herring, whitefish. And with the lake being so cold, it has a nice, firm texture, you know? And I know because we used to work in Chicago a million years ago. The white fish from Lake Superior, by reputation, everybody wants it. And again, that's the heritage of this area. Lake Superior is a rough lake. That's what I see. I see it the is, waves out there. It's an inland ocean, basically. It's huge, it's deep, and it's dangerous. The fishermen here, they brave the waters. The execution from boat to filleting to my back door is unbelievable. Let's pick up a couple hundred pounds, go back to my restaurant, we'll do some plank style whitefish tonight, and we'll eat well. Walter, welcome to my restaurant. You finally made it after all these years. Shh, it's worth the wait. It's beautiful over here. Your location is beautiful, your restaurant is beautiful. I can see why people would sit here and don't want to go back. So, it's and, and you're at the, the most beautiful time of the year right now. There's no nicer place than Northern Michigan for the fall season. It has a lot of uh, nostalgic view for me because all your German writings, and you told me that some Germans initially built it over here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's steeped in history up here, but uh, being in the Upper Peninsula, we've got, uh, we put our little twist on some of our, I some know. of our historical cuisine. We've got the, the beautiful Lake Superior whitefish. It is. Very nice, firm texture. We've created a unique recipe here that's very consumer friendly. And a few unique things about this preparation is the applewood smoked bacon. It's available at specialty markets, but you gotta look for it. Some people might wonder bacon and, and fish together. 
it's not a new concept, you know. No. Mother Washington already had it in, in her book, <laughs> Veal and Crab Meat. I mean, this is, but this is unique because you're also not just using any kind of bacon, you're using smoked bacon, so it enhances. Absolutely. You know, we call this plank style whitefish. It's not planked whitefish, it's plank style whitefish because we create our own plank out of our bacon. If you're looking for a thin filet, you don't want to do a large, thick uh, steak yeah. of swordfish or, or grouper or yeah, something would, like that. The, by the time it'd be glazed, it would burn. It would burn. So we can get into the marinade first. So the first ingredient we're going to use is our orange juice, honey. Michigan actually does have a good amount of fresh honey available. Soy sauce. Ketchup is very, very high in sugar, and it also really helps with the color of the glaze. It gives it a beautiful the acidity to the ketchup. Here, so yes, absolutely. To get a bit of ginger. Mm -hmm. Okay, a little bit of salt, some pepper. You always got to have salt. Salt makes everything better, even if it has soy sauce in it. Now our ginger. You're going to use a good amount of ginger in, into it because that's what will emulsify it. I'm going to take that, and then I'm going to lightly blend that. Then I'll slowly add my oil into there, and that'll create a natural emulsification. If you were to just put it all together, the oil would just float right to the top. So, so you want to create that natural emulsification. The natural emulsification of that, you've got a beautiful basting. See, this also was what's unique about it, because but the basting will then really enhance the flavor again, you know? Yes, it actually candies the bacon, yeah, yeah. so the bacon's really, really sweet. Yeah. And I've learned over the years working with you, there's no substitute for quality. Absolutely. You know, this, right from Wisconsin, applewood smoked bacon, nice, lean yeah. bacon, very, very thinly sliced. Once we're wrapping it, it needs to be a little warmer, and it's good. So you're gonna stretch the bacon just a little bit. And at the restaurant here, presentation is everything. So you wanna keep the bacon going in the same direction. Now we're gonna take our whitefish, no pin bones, okay? You don't want it loose, flapped over. Mm -hmm. You want the, the fish to stay nice and thick. And then we're gonna take this tail piece here and we're gonna just fold it over just a little bit like that. So it doesn't burn on the grill. So you need to the bone. Again, what's the most important thing is it's all the same thickness going through. Yep. And we're gonna take this bacon now and we're gonna tuck it under here. Okay. And then we're gonna take this one here and we're gonna bring it back around and tuck it right there. So we've got a nice piece of fish like that. Okay, same thing. Take this one here, tuck it underneath here. My grill chef that does these, he can do these a lot faster than I can. So, but he he got he has a he has he's a machine when he when he goes to make them. Now we just invert it, okay, and we're gonna press that down on there. So we've got our nice plank style whitefish. So again, the bacon is a little warm, so it stretches nice. That's what you want. That's what you want. You want you want it. You don't thin. want it too thick. And if you didn't slice the bacon that thin it would never caramelize and it would just, you got a gummy piece of bacon. Well, if anybody knows about seafood, it's all the years we've worked in Miami together, gosh. Absolutely, oh, Miami and, <laughs> and in the Caribbean yeah. and stuff like that. Okay, so take this, cool it in the cooler. The bacon, again, will get nice and firm on it. We're gonna season it. The seasoning is a seafood blend that we use and, and it gives it a, a distinct flavor, okay? Again, don't season this ahead of time. The salt will just dry out the protein. Yeah, but you're gonna take it straight to the grill now. So. We're gonna take it straight to the grill. The grill is hot? The grill is hot, 500 plus degrees. So when I put the fish on the grill, I do not put any marinade on there because if you did, it would just stick right to the grill. That sugar would just caramelize sure. right to the grill. Render the bacon down just a little bit. Then when I flip it over, the bacon is already nice and seared. Then I'll baste it with the marinade and repeat two times. Six to eight minutes on each side. And continually basting it on the other side. So both sides of the bacon are nice and crisp. and you end up with a finished product like this, which is Beautiful. fantastic. And notice the bacon is very, very thin, it, yeah. paper thin, and that's the, the whole process of the sugar in the marinade. This fish is nice and moist, cooked right through to an internal temperature of 160. The aroma that comes with this is unbelievable. Look at the flakiness of this fish. 
It's beautiful. Nice, white, clean fish out of the bottom of Lake Superior and just taste the flavor for that applewood smoked bacon. Salute. Oh. Delicious? Beyond Un delicious. Unbelievable, huh? So the flavors, the, the combination of the flavors you got in there is great. I would have never thought when you first told me about it, the change, but it works. Mm -hmm. It really works well. Three five. That's really beautiful. It's great to have you here in Northern Michigan to try this for a change because you can't taste it in a photo. Unfortunately, nobody can. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. Copper was originally discovered up here roughly 7,500 years ago. This is pure copper. It doesn't need to be smelted. You can make fish hooks and arrowheads and spear points and utensils. When the Europeans hit the shores on our eastern coast, there was an interest in where this was coming from. It took a while. The boom started in the late 1830s, early 1840s. With all that excitement about it, there was a tremendous influx of people and money to start these early mines. Well, Chef, I'd like to welcome you to Quincy Mine. So, no Chef Head today? Not huh? today. You're going to be doing something different. <laughs> Very good. As we go back into the mine, the rock that surrounds us is some of the oldest rock in the world you can put your hands on. 1.1 billion year old lava flows. Going down in the mines, it's a harsh life, it's a hard life. These men are working 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week. So now we're about 365 feet underground and we are barely scratching the surface here at Quincy. We're at the seventh level of the mine, seven of 92. Gosh. Roughly over a mile in depth, straight down below us. Of course, at this period to get here, we would have been climbing ladders. Sure. Not an easy job, I can tell Not you Not an easy yeah. job. These are pretty much the basic tools. A handheld drill steel, so you can punch a hole in the rock. Gotcha. Eventually, we're gonna put black powder in those yep. holes. We'll put some fuses on them, and then we're going to get out of harm's way. We're going to get around the corner. Copper is very heavy. Oh, a cubic foot of copper weighs about 569 pounds. The largest piece documented in the UP came in at 500 tons. When you blast it and it's first exposed before it has a chance to become oxidized, it gleams just like a newly minted penny quartz crystals with copper mixed in it, calcite crystals with copper, or what we call half-breed, which is crystals of copper and silver. So these men are finding this stuff and bringing it up. Tom, so how much copper was generated in a mine like that? Quincy Mine had a 99-year mining history, and just under a billion pounds of copper just from this mine. Going into the 1880s, the copper country supplied America with 90% of its copper. At this period, we're a young country. We are a growing country on our way to becoming an industrial power. And copper is That's the basis of an industrial. Essential. Essential, yes. Uh, makes good cooking pans, yeah, right? Yeah, Moves I, I that heat evenly, <laughs> yes. Copper sheathing for our warships. Copper for brass and for bronze. So you can make the tools of industry. 1861 so we can finish stringing a telegraph line from Washington to California. California yeah. Instant communication, yeah. coast to coast. Right now, there's about a one billion pound demand for new copper every year. Yeah. And that's Quincy's 99 year output, so you can see how the world has gotcha. been using gotcha. copper. I think I better stick to cooking. <laughs> but I will use your copper for my pots. Walter, I think we should go back to the 1850s, don't Whew, you? I'm ready for it. I have We're no ready. choice. Let's hit it. <laughs> wow. In the 1850s, we have nothing but tallow candles to see what we're doing. Like any mining district, there's a tremendous excitement and everybody's out there in the woods staking their claims. Very quickly, 
there was a need to establish a federal presence up here. This army post was built to keep the peace in Michigan's cup of country. Fort Wilkins settled things down a little bit, especially the standardization of mineral claims, who bought what and who owns what. It was very important because the ones that did hit on the major seams or veins, those were the ones making money. We still export copper. The United States is still a major player in the world copper market. All right, Walter, I do have a surprise for you down here. You've got to have some food, and that's what the pasty is all about. It's quick, it's easy, and for a lot of these people, the pasties were an inexpensive meal with a lot of calories. Which you need down here because oh, you have so, so much physical work to be done. Potatoes, onions, big dollop of lard in the crust. It actually looks very appetizing, very beautiful, all layered in there, it's, it's gorgeous. Wow, it's really delicious actually, and really good. It hits good. the spot. Yeah. From everybody up here in the copper country, we want to thank you for your interest in this special, sometimes forgotten, unknown part of our history. Absolutely. Bought over by 19th century miners from Cornwall, England. The portable and convenient nature of the pasty made it a stable food for generations of families to come. Today, one might say it's the unofficial state dish of the UP. I met up with Dane at his favorite spot to see how those historical favorites are made. I've been friends with Eric Permadeck for a long time, and he's been making them longer than anybody I know. He takes the potatoes, rutabagas, onions, and he'll grind them through by hand. Season it real well, salt, pepper. Add his ground beef. Takes a scale dough ball. He'll sheet his lard-based dough through his hand sheeter, runs it through one time, runs it through another time. Nice, thin lard-based dough down onto the prep table. Takes his meat and potato mixture, portions it out into a cup. He flips it over like lightning fast, and then he takes his hand and he's got this secret move, I think. I'm not sure what it is, but he wiggles all the way across and it comes out and he's got this sealed, beautiful pasty. And he makes a little hole so the steam can evaporate so the dough don't break. He puts a little vent on the top yeah. and he does it again and again and again, and it's amazing to watch him. I mean, he can make a thousand pasties a day here when he gets going. some ketchup and butter, some people prefer them. Look at that, Walter. Beautiful, look at that. It's beautiful, right huh? out of the oven. Oh, look at that. You can, and you can eat it with your hands if you want, because it comes with a handle. Oh. Delicious, huh? Boy. The little bit of sugar in the vegetables make a beautiful crust on the outside of it, too, as well. So it's really, really nice. Well done. Mm -hmm. What's nice about it, I didn't realize until I got here, the ingredients are raw in there and then cooked in the oven, so the pat or the dough, is like preserves the flavors, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, if you would pre-cook that, it would never be the same. It would never be the same. It's simple, but very just on the mic. But it's interesting for me that this is a German-built restaurant with all kind of German insignia, which is really, really interesting. So it's befitting that I come in. It's also befitting that you made my favorite dish. I know you long enough to know that, number one, you love Oktoberfest, you like to dance, you may drink a beer or two, but I know one thing deep down you love about Oktoberfest, Wuladen. Wuladen to me is like soul food. We make Wuladen, where I come from, the Black Forest, uh, maybe every couple of weeks. It's a beautiful dish. You can eat it with spatula, potato, or like you serve here, with German potato salad and red cabbage. It's a perfect combination. The beef, very important that it's very thinly sliced, because as we're rolling that, all these flavors here, we're going to marry all those flavors together in the braising. And actually, that's the very important part. If you go to your butcher and say, cut it for me for Wuladen, depending where you go, the thinner, 
the better. Normally, it's not a very expensive cut of meat used for that. You're no. not using a New York strip steak no. or, a, or a tenderloin. You basically use the inside round. Well, at the Harbor House, the butcher's meat. So what, I, what, <laughs> I, what I've done is I've sliced it very thin. Yeah, but again, key component is quality product. Applewood smoked bacon, good crisp pickles, a nice spicy Dijon mustard that has a little horseradish, yeah, yeah, a little horseradish in it, and we put chives in it. Some people use parsley, yeah. we use chives. Chives is nice anyways, yeah. put some Christmas to it, yeah, okay. So first thing we need to do is get a sharp knife, get an onion. There's uh, some cookbooks out there that uh, recommend that you spread the onion down. But if you if you prep them right away, you don't need to spread them down. Yeah, the absolutely. Onion, onions do have a tendency to uh, spoil, spoil the dish, you know, right? Yeah, some people and some people is you know when you're sweating down the onion, you're off gassing it. You're getting rid of the, getting rid of the, exactly, the, the burp the yep. burp of the onion. So I choose to do it from a from a raw state. I think I get a better flavor no, no, it's for better. it. That's how I do. It. I'm looking out the window and all I see is this unbelievable. Uh, Mass of water, Lake Superior. You told me it's the largest freshwater lake in the world? The largest freshwater lake in the world, yes it is. You know, so. Okay, so now we're gonna take these two, two pieces of meat, again, um, inside round versus top round. Inside round, a little bit more fat on it. More um, flavor. I, more flavor to it, so I like using an in, inside round. Some people might might say, oh, it's, it's too fatty. Well, once we go through the braising process, you need, it. you, you need, you need some, you need but, that. Actually, you, you put bacon in it as well, as you know. Yes, so we, we do and add some bacon. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't want to beat it out. Again, even, nice, even texture. Yeah. Nice, even texture. Just lightly pound it out. Put that on, yeah, maybe my yeah, assistant yeah. there, perfect. Yeah, no so salt and pepper, always a key ingredient. Anytime you're cooking raw protein, always always season the raw protein first. Don't put the salt on it after it's cooked, no good. So we'll put salt and pepper, salt and pepper on our rouladens. One way I like to do the rouladen is, number one, I start yeah. off with the uh, Dijon good mustard. Yeah. A good amount of Dijon mustard, That's okay? Flavor, yeah. it, it really creates the flavor. And here at the Harbor House, when we make these, Two uh, top or inside rounds yield probably about eh, 50 pieces, so 25 orders. So you make this occasionally as a special? We make it as a feature, yeah. yes we do. As I'm putting my onions in here, I create a little pocket at the bottom. And then with the bacon, some people use the scraps of bacon, uh -huh. ends and pieces of bacon. I cut a nice baton. It's a nice uh -huh. twist, got you. That. And then the pickle. Chives. Again, this dish is an excellent dish. It holds very well. So once I'm gonna roll it, I, I create a little purse. You make a packet in the I'm, side. I make a little packet at the bottom. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll tuck those sides in. That way all my ingredients are staying in my roulade. Again, stretch it a little bit, roll it, roll it, and I create my roulade. And then I'll take my bamboo skewer and I'll skewer it, okay? My perfect roulade right there. What's unique about this dish is the flavors when it sits for a while, and then the braising, you know. The, the Absolutely, that's a nice lunch right there. And again, everything is sealed in nice nice and tight on there. Now I'll just take these, I'll flour them, we'll sear it in a the pan, then we'll put it into a roasting pot. We'll cover the rouladens with liquid. A beef stock, real slow, 350 degrees for about three hours. Slow braising, slow, and then, yeah. slow braising. And then once it's braised, you can just fold with the fork. It just fall, it falls yeah, right yeah, out, yeah, right yeah. out the Which is the idea, fantastic. Yeah. Dan, what a fantastic display. So much color, so much height and beauty. It's unbelievable. And I understand it's a big party. We're ready for the big party this weekend. We've got polka music. All of the favorites that you have as a child are here with a little of my twist to them. All of those dishes look spectacular. One of them that stands up to me is obviously the Schweinehaxen, which is one thing you would expect to find at the Oktoberfest in Munich. That there have been parties since 1810, as you know. Without that, there would be no Oktoberfest. You know? Some of the other dishes you incorporated into it. We have some sausage, we get a sauerkraut. And I like the idea that you have combination of different flavors together and also the texture together. This is intriguing to me because you have it on a, in a bed of German potato salad. A yeah. little rendition of the, the traditional Oktoberfest uses the whole fish, but not as consumer friendly, so we're using salmon on the skewer and wood grilled. 
it's beautiful what you've done. And I think I love your philosophy incorporating the regional product into a traditional menu that's been around since 1810. You'll see all the flavors we have for Oktoberfest. It's going to be a great weekend, and we're super glad to have you here. But then, there's one thing missing. Without beer, there's no Oktoberfest, right? We, we got you covered there, Walter. Okay, so guys. Ein Prosit, ein Prosit, der Gemütlichkeit. It means all the best to happiness. Prost. Prost.